Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me, Mark. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, the brief was to um, talk about the, the, the key results from Chapter 4 of the AR5, which was cryosphere observations, like it was at Tudor. But um, I thought that actually would be a bit dry and arid because, you know, the, you, you can read the, the headline results, and I, I will show them briefly, but um, actually mostly what I'm going to talk about um, is my interpretation of that chapter, uh, my interpretation of um, some of the results they present, some of the outstanding issues that exist, some gaps in our understanding and knowledge, and you know, where, where, where we need to go next with some of this work. Um, and there are a number of outstanding issues, which I think... Um, were more or less addressed in the chapter, but I thought it would be more interesting. You, you can read the chapter yourself. So, so um, one of the, 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 the warnings I want to give here is that although um, I'm reporting on this chapter, what I'm saying is my personal interpretation of it. It's not, I'm, I'm not representing IPCC or anything like that at this talk, okay? So let's just get that clear now. Um, now, um, I don't know, I, a bit of a mixed audience, I guess, so um, I thought um, most of you probably oceanographers or, or I don't know, something else, um, but probably not glaciologists, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background just so you understand some of the issues and uh, what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I talk about the modern era, but um, most, most of my results and most of um, um, what's uh, reported in the AR5 in, with any kind of level of accuracy is for the period from 1992 when, when ERS-1 was launched. And ERS-1 had two instruments on board which were particularly useful for measuring mass balance of the ice sheets, and that's the radar altimeter and um, a synthetic aperture radar which allowed us to measure uh, rather accurately for the first time, systematically at least, um, surface velocities in Antarctica and Greenland, and they've been used in a different approach. Um, two entirely independent methods of measuring mass, um, mass balance of the ice sheets. And most of what I'm going to talk about is, 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 is related to the ice sheets. I will talk about glasses and ice caps a little bit. Um, so those, those two instruments um, did provide us um, with a lot of new information about mass trends in um, Antarctica and Greenland. But um, our level of understanding um, and the accuracy and particularly um, our ability to uh, detect regional variations and separate out the sources um, uh, took a, had a significant advance in around about actually ended 2002. It's really 2003 when the data um, became robust. For, and, and I guess all of you know this from Grace and Isa. The problem with that is that um, that's just a decade ago, and um, a decade in terms of ice sheet time is, is, is not very long, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Um, right, this is, this, is, this is my one minute um, ice sheet sort of 101 lesson, um, uh, just, in, just in case. Uh, it's an important point, so I just want to make it. Um, there are two processes that influence ice sheet mass balance. It's true of um, um, some glaciers as well, but only marine terminating glaciers. Um, and those two processes inter have a very different interaction with the climate system. The first process um, is the surface mass balance, SMB. That is everything that happens at the surface of the ice sheet. That is snowfall, um, sublimation, evaporation, and runoff, surface runoff in the case of Greenland. Okay. Um, SMB um, responds almost instantaneously to cha changes in climate. So it's responding to, if you like, you know, weather on a monthly to seasonal to interannual timescale. So there is a very large interannual, um, and, well, yeah, large interannual variability in SMB for both Greenland and Antarctica. And in Greenland, there's a very big seasonal cycle as well. So, very short response time for SMB. The other process um, is ice dynamics. Um, and that, that component is responsible for the flux that crosses the grounding line at the margin of the ice sheets and enters the ocean. So that's the ice, ice discharge component. Um, and what controls ice dynamics? Well, um, on the short term, um, there's an ice-ocean interaction. So there's, there's submarine melting underneath floating ice shelves that influences um, the, the, the stickiness of the grounding line, so basal, basal traction near the grounding line. Glasses may speed up 
um, disintegration of um, an ice shelf such as Larsen C will um, result in acceleration of the grounded um, ice inland of that. Um, but there are other processes. Um, and it's fair to say uh, that uh, both Greenland and Antarctica, in terms of ice dynamics, are not in equilibrium with Holocene climate. They are still responding to changes in the climate system that took place about 10, 12,000 years ago. So some of the response that we're seeing now is due to um, a, a very, very long um, wavelength variations, um, very, very uh, low frequency variations in the climate system. Um, and that poses a problem for, the, uh, I, I'm not supposed to talk about prediction, but I, I, I will tread on Jonathan's toes a little bit here. That poses a problem for things like semi empirical models. Um, it poses a problem for deterministic modeling. Um, and it poses a problem for our interpretation of the recent observations. So remember that we have 10 years of very high resolution regional observations. And some of these processes have a time constant of something like 10 to the 4 years. So um, that's, that's a serious issue. So a little bit about um, where, where we've come from. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, I should thank um, David Vaughan providing me with some of these slides. He was the, uh, one of the two um, uh, coordinating lead authors on this chapter. And, uh, some of these slides, uh, courtesy of David. Um, this is, so GIC -G stands for glasses and ice caps. Um, and this was a paper published in 2006. Uh, Georg Kezo was um, the person responsible both in the AR4 and AR4 for the, the glasses section. And this is a plot of, um, a, it's meant to be a consensus estimate of um, mass trends for um, glasses and ice caps around the world um, since about 1960. It's, it's um, fair to say that we have, um, in terms of our observations suite, we have um, a longer time series of observations of GIC than we do of the ice sheets. But um, almost all of these curves here, these are different assessments from different authors, these, these, these different lines, um, are compilations of in situ measurements um, taken um, from, from glasses. So these are mass balance measurements on individual glasses. Now there are about 120 glasses around the world with long term mass balance records. Um, out of a total of something like 200,000, in excess of 200,000 glasses. So it's a very small sample, um, it's less than 0.05% of, of, of the total number of glasses around the world that we're actually sampling. There's an additional problem here. It's, it's a bit like the tide gauge problem, but actually I think we haven't handled it nearly as well um, as, as um, how you extrapolate the tide gauge record to the whole of the oceans. Um, the glaciers that are sampled um, here are, tend to be low elevation, smaller glaciers that are very accessible. Um, and they um, more than likely are not representative of a whole mountain range but they have been extrapolated to a whole mountain range. They've been extrapolated to the glaciers everywhere. And, um, yeah, I think, I think we, we, you know, the, uh, anyway, this was the state of the art at um, AR4. Um, and if you, if you, I don't know, it's actually very difficult to fit any kind of line through this, but the, the rate for about the last two decades from the previous assessment was a little bit over um, a millimetre a year, something like that, from GIC. And there was, um, I don't know about famous, but there was a, a kind of a high profile paper published in Science by uh, Mark Meyer um, in, I think, 2007, which something like the title like Glasses and Ice Caps are the major contribution to sea level rise. And it had a, a plot, which I'm not going to show because I, I really don't like it, but it's, it's a, a series of um, circles with very large error bars with a line going through it showing that GIC are accelerating with time and they extrapolate that to show that GIC are going to be the largest contribution to this century. Um, where, where were we with um, the ice sheets? So, this was pretty much state of the art um, around about 2006, 2007. These are um, satellite radar alt 
altimetry estimates of volume changes for Antarctica and Greenland. Um, and each of these grids is a, a one degree box, and you can see it's pretty coarse resolution. Um, there's a big problem in Greenland in that almost all the biggest changes are taking place around the margins of the ice sheet, um, and that's where um, altimetry uh, is very, uh, very poorly samples the, the, the uh, volume change, and there were lots of gaps, and the areas are much bigger around the margins. So it's also true to some extent in Antarctica as well, but surface is a little bit lower there. Um, a, diff uh, a major difficulty and something that um, uh, wasn't dealt with particularly effectively for AR4 is converting this volume change to a mass change. Obviously to do that you need density and the, the density it, um, that you choose depends on whether the process responsible for the volume change is either ice dynamics or surface mass balance because if it's if it's a process, if it's say changes in snowfall at the surface, then the density might be um, 300 uh, kilograms per meter cubed. Um, if it's due to ice dynamics, it's going to be three times larger. So there's a factor three difference in the density that you might choose um, depending on the process. And, and, and at that time, we we didn't have a really good um, grip on on the underlying processes and, and getting the density right. So that's, that's kind of where we were. Um, and things have got uh, a lot better. Um, this is uh, supposed to be a kind of consensus. It says reconcile estimate. I'm, I mean, I don't know. It seemed to be flavor of the month, that phrase, uh, that word, rather. Um, although uh, I'm not sure it's particularly reconciled. And, and likewise with the ice sheets. These are, these are the, the two estimate. Well, this is the, this black box is the estimate from this very recent paper that um, was used was cited very extensively in AR five for ice caps. Um, these observations come from both ISAT um, altimetry estimates of volume change and grace, and the the width of the bar uh, is meant to indicate the uncertainty in these observations. This this box here is from a GRACE-only study by um, a, a, someone called Jacob War et al. from um, Colorado, um, covering um, pretty much the same time period and just about overlapping by one standard deviation. Um, but you, one of the things to note about both these estimates for at least the last decade or so is that the numbers are significantly smaller than estimates from uh, the, the, the other approach I mentioned, which is this scaling up of um, in situ observations, which are these um, various green, blue, and dashed lines here. Some of them, so, so this is actually, I guess, in reasonable agreement, and that's the, the York case of 2006 paper, but others by Gwen Cogley um, have estimates for the last decade which are about a factor two larger than the satellite observations, perhaps slightly more. We look at the last decade. Um, the the rate. I don't know. It depends whether you you know which one you want to choose. But the, the rate is somewhere around about 0.75 millimeters a year for the last decade. Um, for the ice sheets, um, things things have, have major major advances, and that there are a lot of um, new literature. I mean, really dozens and dozens of papers synthesized in the AR5 report, in, in the AR5 chapter. Um, uh, this is, uh, <laughs> um, so you'll notice um, some of these are kind of self-citations. It's not because, you know, I think this works the best than anything, it's just that I'm a little bit more familiar with it and um, I've, I've kind of had the figures to hand, that's my excuse anyway. Um, so th this is an estimate, regional estimate of um, mass trends um, for Antarctica where we were able to identify the origin of the change. So um, separate out whether it was due to ice dynamics or surface mass balance. We didn't really go into the details in the paper. These plots indicate the magnitude of the mass loss or mass gain for every one of these 70 or so basins. These black lines indicate different drainage basins in Antarctica. And every one of these basins has a, a blob associated with it where we've estimated the mass um, gain or loss. Blue is uh, mass gain, so there are a few areas where the ice sheet is gaining mass. 
and red is, is uh, lost. And I think this is a very familiar result now with, um, I mean, it was, it was first shown in radio altimetry, but this quantifies the numbers rather well. Um, the biggest losses are taking place in the Amazon Sea sector of um, West Antarctica, with the second largest in the Antarctic Peninsula. So it's West Antarctica that we currently believe is um, producing the biggest contribution to, to sea level from Antarctica. Um, in this study, there is a small um, positive and statistically significant contribution from East Antarctica, um, but that that it had a large it had a large uncertainty on it, and um, um, I think there is still um, if you look at the most least recent literature, there is still s some uncertainty as to whether East Antarctica is gaining or losing mass. That's an area where I really don't think we've quite nailed it yet. Um, it's a huge area. Um, I mean, Antarctica itself is bigger than conterminous USA. Um, uh, in terms of altimetry, um, uh, so it's you know um, 10 million square kilometers. Um, a small, a very small error or bias in our measurement from radio altimetry, averaged over the whole of East Antarctica, is going to add up to a lot of gigatons of mass gain or mass loss, and that's the kind of challenge we have with East Antarctica. It's a signal to noise problem. Um, Greenland, I, I, again, sorry about this, this but I, 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 I do like this paper. I, I think it's, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice study where we compare the three different approaches that are available to us from, for, from satellites for estimating mass balance in the ice sheets. That's um, satellite altimetry, measuring volume changes from both laser and radar altimetry. Um, so in this case, we're using ISAT. Um, we have the mass budget or input output method where we measure the amount of ice crossing the grounding line, the, uh, the ice discharge, and we compare that with the amount of snowfall and runoff at the surface. That's called the mass budget approach um, or flux divergence approach. Um, and the third approach, of course, is GRACE. So in this study, we compare all three of these techniques, and they, they are all largely um, independent of each other. Um, and so if we get agreement, it gives us you know, a certain amount of confidence that we, we're getting the numbers right. Um, and what, if you look at the, the kind of headline plot here, you probably can't see it very well. This plot here is the whole of Greenland. The, the green line here shows the sum is, is, is the difference between um, ice discharge and surface mass balance. So that's our input output method. And the black um, circles with little arrow bars on are, are grace estimates for Mingo Saska. And you can see that actually we're getting very good agreement between the two. And one of the nice things about this study is that we, we, are, it's, it, we do separate out the origin of the, the mass loss or gain for each basin, um, so we are able to determine whether it's due to surface mass balance or ice discharge, and that's important for understanding the, the well, the origin of the mass change, and having some understanding of um, what it might do in the future as well. Whether whether it's a whether how reliable an extrapolation of those trends into the near future actually are. Um, there are, uh, so for one or two basins, the agreement isn't so good. So, for example, Basin F, which is this one down in the southwest, which contains Jakob Sardinus Frey, the biggest glass ceiling in Greenland, which has been losing a lot of mass. Um, the agreement between mass budget and uh, grace is not perfect, but by and large, um, they, they are showing good agreement. And when we compare that with our ISAT volume changes, we, again, you know, the, the agreement is within the error bars and generally fairly consistent. So, at least for the last decade, uh, I think we have got a pretty good understanding of what the ice sheets have done, what their contribution has been, and what the origin of that is, whether it's due to changes in, um, at, whether it's an atmospheric process, is, in other words, SMB, or whether it's related to um, either internal variability in the ice sheet, just kind of fluctuations in ice dynamics or perhaps some kind of ocean forcing around the margins. This is just, um, well, this is, this, was, this is one of David's figures and, and there's a bit of self-citation on his part here. Um, it's, a, it's a nice result. Um, this is 
And it, w w w what he was doing here is comparing what we had, which was a rather kind of um, incomplete picture of volume changes um, for AR4 with uh, a very detailed, um, in terms of spatial resolution, um, understanding of uh, volume changes in Antarctica and Greenland for the ice map period. The temporal sampling from ISAT wasn't great. Um, as I'm sure, sure you all know, um, there were problems with the laser, so um, they only had, they switched on for about 35 days around about every three months, so we, we didn't have too many observations over time. And these are the numbers that are reported in the, the chapter. Um, I, I, they're um, not an awful lot to say around them, um, except that um, um, that the rate, the rate over the um, longer term period uh, is, is much lower than the rate for the last decade. So the rate for 2002 to 2012 is, is considerably larger for both Greenland and Antarctica. And that's a statistically significant, significant result. And, and um, people have made a, a, a lot of noise about that. I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, Annie. Um, already showed this. Um, it's, it's been kind of traditional to separate out Antarctica, Greenland, glasses and ice caps. And I'm not sure it's the most useful thing to do. Um, um, just, well, uh, these numbers here are just for Greenland and Antarctica. So that, 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 that's a millimeter a year um, for the last six years for the ice sheets. Um, glasses and ice caps that aren't here, but they're about 0.8 millimetres a year for the long, for, for, for the 20 year period without a, a, a particular acceleration over the last decade. If you, <coughs> interestingly, actually, if you take it up to 2008, this is about 14 millimetres, which is about the same as glasses and like that. So they're around about the same um, contribution um, over the, that 20 year period, very approximately. But one of the important um, points to note about this figure is um, the gradient of the line is obviously the rate and um, for both Antarctica and Greenland the rate has been um, increasing and for Greenland so for 2012 um, I, it's, it's, you know, it's dangerous to look at very short periods for ice sheets for as I explained but if we take 2012, uh, con Greenland contribute, lost something like one and a half millimetres on its own. So um, it's, and, and the increase loss from Greenland has been relatively monotonic. Um, one of the reasons it isn't particularly useful to separate out glasses and ice caps is that, you know, why would you, uh, from, from, from Greenland and Antarctica, Glasses and ice caps are distributed all around the world. The vast majority of them, admittedly, in the Northern Hemisphere. But why would you expect glasses um, in Scandinavia to behave in the same way as the Himalayas, for example? They don't necessarily, and climate forcing may be very different. And so I don't think it's always that useful to present it as um, a kind of, actually in the literature, as a competition between which is the largest signal. Is it glasses and ice caps or, or the ice sheet? That's not useful to do. And actually, if you looked at, um, if you partitioned this, you'd find that over half the contribution from GIC comes from the Arctic, um, including the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, and so if you um, looked at the regional distribution of the cryospheric contribution to sea level rise, you'd find that about three quarters of it, over let's say the last decade, came from the Arctic. Um, and, and you know, a quarter from everywhere else. And in terms of sea level rise, that's probably a more useful um, uh, way to partition the, the losses. This is uh, a, a, one of the figures from um, AR5 uh, chapter, just to show the sort of uh, kind of level of detail that we have about recent mass changes. On the bottom here, we've got um, for three different periods, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but this is 03 to 012, so it's roughly. It's a ten year period, this is four year, and this is another four year period. Um, sorry, that's a seven year period. Um, and this is a great mass trend in centimetres of water equivalent year over Antarctica, um, consensus estimates. Um, and this 
so, so that's, that's the gravity estimates of mass change. Um, these two figures are meant to indicate the mass budget approach, the information we have to, to determine the input output method. This is the velocity field over Antarctica, which is now for the first time complete. We have velocity estimates everywhere. Um, this is um, the output of a regional climate model driven by um, era interim for the period 1979 to the present day. So we have about 25 years of what we believe are pretty robust um, estimates of um, P minus E and um, other, other relevant climate over Antarctica. The um, accumulation rates in Antarctica from this regional climate model have been independently tested against ice cores and things like that, and, and, and um, they do seem to be pretty reliable, at least for 25 years. And this is um, ice estimates of uh, volume change. Have the same for Greenland, um, except for some reason, don't know why, the figures have been swapped. So on the top we've got Grace. Um, and again, this is the same regional climate model. This time, um, it's actually for a longer period. It's from 1958, so we have something like 50 years of what we believe are reasonably reliable um, reanalysis or high-resolution surface mass balance of Greenland. Uh, we only have a, a robust time series of surface velocities since 1992. It's the long to be as one. That's complete velocity field, but we need to know how the velocity field is evolving, and this is ISAP um, elevation changes. And these are the numbers, um, numbers for um, well, 18 years to sit here, sit here period. And you can see uh, apparently that there's something like a, a doubling in the mass loss in Greenland um, uh, between you know 18 years and the last six. Um, and I, I want to. Um, say something about whether whether that that's that's um, a um, how much we should be bothered about that or, or, or what, what that's telling us about the system. So this was a paper um, that has had a lot of citations now um, by Isabella Feliconia, who um, it was in GRL, um where she um, fitted a second order polynomial to the greatest time to the Greenland and Antarctica and concluded that this was a statistically, that it gave a better fit, that, that the acceleration was statistically significant from, from that kind of fairly simple analysis. And um, interestingly, she and um, her husband um, updated that um, estimate in 2011 um, and extended it back to 1992. But also interestingly, the, the rate of acceleration um, using a longer time series and actually slightly different data and a, a couple more years data from Grace, um, halved. So, I mean, immediately that should raise some alarm bells about whether this, um, whether acceleration is meaningful or not. Um, but um, I should say, oh yeah, one, one, one of the things, yes, yeah, so, so, so this, this paper um, in Gerald was published only two years ago. It's already had a couple of hundred citations. It's been, yeah, so it's very heavily cited. Um, it, it, um, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> what can I, uh, you know, uh, people believe it. You know, they think it's an important result that, that the mass loss in the ice is accelerated. And as a consequence, um, uh, many, um, many of my colleagues, many glaciologists have um, s uh, considered it fit then to extrapolate that time series um, into the future. And this is, this is just what you do if you take Isabella's results and um, you, you extend that, you assume that that rate of acceleration is going to carry on. Um, and I've seen this, this presented at you know, um, a really big conferences and things as a sort of legitimate thing to do. And I know I'm not supposed to talk about projection, but uh, you know, I have a few words on it. Um, this is what happens if you do that. Uh, this is the cumulative trend you get on, on the left here. From both ice sheets, by the end of the century, you get something like 80 centimetres. Um, and wow, you get a sea level rate of one and, one and a half centimetres a year by 2100 if you do that. Um, but uh, I don't think that's a great. Sorry? Oh. 
uh, no, I'm not going to start there. I'm, I'm going I'm to say why I think that's not a good idea. Um, uh, you'll notice that some of the people, some some of the people that published that, and then also published papers that sort of thought suggested it's not a good idea. The same people, and you'll have to ask them why why why, why they did that. That's not me. Um, but um, this was a paper in um, service, a special issue of survey in geophysics where a uh, colleague, Michael van der Brucke, who, who um, does a lot of work with these regional climate models, looks at the interannual variability just from the surface mass balance. And this dashed black line is the interannual variability for about 20 years ago, for Antarctica here and Greenland here. Um, and the point, the point about this um, this particular paper is uh, just a kind of warning to people, uh, say, look, um, uh, and these boxes are various different estimates um, from the literature, from various different sources. Be careful, the interannual variability is very large. It's particularly large in Antarctica where there isn't really a seasonal cycle either. Um, whereas actually in Greenland, the, the mass loss is larger and the interannual variability is a bit smaller, so maybe we can, we can infer something from that. And as a consequence of that work, um, another colleague, um, someone called Bert Bouters, um, who is currently in Colorado working with John Wall, um, published a paper um, very recently, a bit too, bit too recently for um, AR5, um, where we looked um, rather, rather rigorously at whether the accelerations that had been observed in the GRACE record were genuinely statistically significant based on our understanding, our best understanding of the interannual variability in mass balance of both items. The top graph here, you probably can't see it, so Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right. Um, top graph are, um, are the absolute values, the, the rate of mass loss, and these, these bars here are different estimates. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to talk about the top bar. What you'll see for both Antarctica and Greenland is that, yes, the, the signal, the actual mass loss, is, is, is above the internal variability. But when it comes to the acceleration, if it lies in this blue area, this is kind of where it's uncertain. You'll, you'll see that for um, Greenland, um, certainly any estimates of the acceleration from Grace are not statistically significant. Um, a very careful study, and you know, uh, as I believe that they, 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 should, they should not be interpreted um, as um, something that serves something that you, you, you should try and extrapolate. Um, the slight exception to that is that if you take the, the, the full time series that Eric Mignot's developed going back to 1992 from mass budget, so this is velocity versus surface mass balance over 20 years then it, it just about creeps above the kind of noise level. Um, and it's, it's the same story for Antarctica as well. Um, and that, that brings me on to um, some other problems with the satellite record, which, remember, is really very short. Um, this is from um, something that was really quite uh, different, sort of quite unusual for, for, for me to be involved in it, it was um, what's called an expert judgment elicitation exercise where we asked a group of experts um, um, a load of different questions. And this particular question I think is absolutely central to um, well, what we should be doing in the future to try and understand the actual um, behaviour and predict its future response to climate policy. Um, um, but also absolutely central to, to, to um, how we interpret the um, satellite record. Um, very, very crudely, the question was something like, um, is, is the last 20 years of increased mass loss from Greenland and Antarctica, are we looking at ice sheet weather or is it ice sheet climate? I mean, it wasn't phrased like that, it was phrased along something along the lines of, um, is, it a secular, is it a secular trend or is, is it um, just internal variability in the ice sheet climate system, something like that. Um, and this is, these... Um, what you should focus on here, there's four different histograms here. This is, this is um, we asked this um, in 2010 and again in 2012 as a kind of test of the repeatability of um, this, this kind of assessment. And these experts really are the experts. These are the people 
all the same people I've just cited who are publishing all this work, both observationists and Aishit novelists. Um, there are about 30 of them that we asked. Um, and um, this is the result. Um, so, so, like a, so uh, a value of one means, yes, definitely it's a secular trend. Um, uh, likely of zero means that no, absolutely definitely not, it's, inter it's internal variability in the system. Um, two really striking things about these results, so let's just look at the kind of yellowy, orangey, mud coloured, whatever it is, um, histogram in the middle here. Um, uh, that's a 2012 result. Um, um, two things. So um, the, the uh, median probability is about 0.5. In other words, could be either. And the other thing um, that I think is really interesting is that there is no consensus amongst the experts. In other words, um, we don't know and we don't agree. So, uh, I mean, I, and I, this is absolutely key. Um, um, and it's key for, this is one of my favourite, favourite figures. I, 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 just, I just show it to wind Jonathan up, actually, really. Um, but um, this is from the AR4. The, the, these, these are many different um, AODCM simulations of future climate, um, uh, which we use to force um, an IT model for Antarctic agreement. Um, and you can see that they're inverted, so Antarctica gains mass and Greenland loses mass. Um, these dashed lines are actually where we are in about 2010, so sort of here. And you can see that they're way off the scale. So, so um, I used to present this to say, well, look, the, the, the models, either the climate that's forcing the models, or the ice sheet models themselves are wrong. But actually, you know what? If it's internal variability in the ice sheet climate system, you would not expect these to reproduce it anyway. So, so I, I mean, knowing whether we're looking at a secular trend, whether we're looking at, say, anthropogenic forcing of, um, external forcing of the ice sheets, or whether it's um, in terms of it is, is really rather essential um, and it, for, for other reasons as well because the modeling community are desperately trying to reproduce the satellite record as a proof that their models are doing what we think the real system does but likewise you know if it's internal variability we don't necessarily expect them to do that why, why should they and uh, so I put wrong in inverted commas because the models very well may not be wrong. They haven't reproduced the last 20 years, but we don't know whether we think they should have done. Um, and this is a nice paper by um, some Twyla Moon, who's a, a postdoc PhD student of Ian Jockins. Uh, details don't really matter, but the, the point, this is Greenland, and these are different estimates of velocities over um, about a 10-year period in Greenland. And the colours here show speed ups and slowdowns. And the point is, um, what, what they show really graphically and, and, and nicely in this study, which was published in Science, I think, um, 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 last year, I think it was, um, is that, that these, these glaciers along the east coast of Greenland are all experiencing the same climate forcing, but they're all responding in a really rather different way. So I argue, I would argue, that um, actually a deterministic modelling approach to, to predicting what the ice sheets uh, are going to do is not really um, entirely appropriate because there is a very significant stochastic component to how they behave. And, and, and that's kind of, um, yeah, complex. So what I've highlighted here, in, in, intra-regional intra variability shows a complex response to regional and local forcing. Uh, in other words, it's all over the place. Um, so that's what we know or don't know um, and understand about the ice sheets um, 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 for a very short period um, in ice sheet history. Prior to 1992, well, I kind of intentionally left this figure blank uh, <laughs> because that's about how much we know. Um, Really, um, I mean, if you look in the AR4, there's an estimate for the contribution of the ice sheets to sea level rise from 1960s to 1990-something. I don't know where those numbers came from. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, very difficult. We really have very poor understanding of um, 
um, I sheet behaviour prior to 1992. Um, there is one figure uh, that I included. This is some work that I've been, we've been working on with uh, colleagues from Denmark, um, from um, DTU, uh, Technical University of Denmark. Um, and uh, it's illustrative. What it shows is um, this, this dashed line is the Little Ice Age maximum extent um, in, um, on the west coast of one of the glaciers in Greenland. And what they've done is a very careful reconstruction of the Little Ice Age extent of Greenland over the whole of southern Greenland. And we'll try and get this stuff published at the minute. Um, uh, and that's kind of one, one, one way that we can get a handle on it. But that's uh, for one, one period, about 300 years ago. Um, we don't really know about the rate of loss between then and now. And for Antarctica, um, well, we, we can't do that kind of thing at all. So we, we really are um, somewhat shooting in the dark for, for that period. Um, so I, I've said all that. Um, I hope I've made it um, sort of fairly clear that I think that you know, any kind of extrapolation other than maybe a few years into the future is, is really um, unsafe. Um, is it weather or climate? And um, that kind of begs the question, you know, should we take a deterministic modelling approach to, to, to this problem or not? Um, and the other big question, I think, that, and I don't have the answer to it right now, but I think, you know, we, we really, to understand how the ice sheets do respond to external forcing um, from observations, we need to find a way to push time series back somehow. And I'll stop there.